Hello everyone, Blind Dweller here, and welcome to the third and final episode of the shocking life and performance art of Marina Abramovich. Apologies that it's taken a while to continue this series. For those who don't know, I needed to take a break for a while because I had other videos that I wanted to release before the end of 2023, and there's a lot of research that has gone into this series so far, and the last thing I wanted to do was burn myself out or end up rushing a documentary. But now it's a new year, I'm fresh and ready to go, and looking forward to returning to taking a deep look at this very unique and controversial artist. In the last episode, we looked at her first ever performances, including the infamous piece titled Rhythm Zero, that a lot of people regard as her most controversial and well-known performance. If you haven't seen that episode yet, please make sure you do so, by the way. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at an interesting shift in her work, where her performances began to explore much broader and deeper concepts, some even verging on the spiritual. Starting with a significant period in her life, where she would meet a vital character who would briefly become her lover and artistic soulmate, named Frank Uwe Lysipen, or as is more widely known, Ulai. We've got a lot to uncover for this final chapter, so please make yourself comfortable, or I guess since we're looking at Marina Abramovich, please make yourself uncomfortable, and please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to catch up with more videos from me on the weird and wonderful side of the art world. Welcome to another video everyone. This is the final instalment of the shocking life and performance art of Marina Abramovich. In the summer of 1975, following the buzz and uproar that rippled across the art world with Rhythm Zero, Marina Abramovich was invited to Vienna in Austria to perform pieces that were arguably much darker and much more graphic than anything she had performed before. Yet strangely, there isn't much information on these pieces except for what Marina herself writes about in her biography, Walk Through Walls. In the book, she details a rather grim performance that she was involved in, conducted by another controversial conceptual artist named Hermann Nitsch, who was predominantly infamous for creating dark and violent spectacles that often used nude performers and real blood within acts that replicated unholy and sacrificial rituals. The performance Marina took part in would be no different. Quote, that summer, Nitsch staged a performance in a castle outside Vienna called Pritzendorf. The piece was to last 24 hours. There were 60 participants, including me, most of the others were men. Some were naked, some were dressed all in white. I was placed on a wooden stretcher, naked and blindfolded. And the stretcher was leaned against a concrete wall. As gloomy music played, Nitsch poured sheep blood and organs, eyes and liver, over my belly and between my legs. Things got stranger from there. After this had gone on for 12 hours, I took off my blindfold and walked away. Not that I couldn't take it physically, I just didn't want to be part of it anymore. I understood it was not my thing. It was the enormous amount of animal's blood, and the fact that we had to drink it, and that it all took place in a chapel in the castle. It felt like a kind of black mass, or bacchanal. It seemed so negative to me, but at bottom it just was not my story, not conceptually, or in any other way." End quote. Following this, Marina chose to stay in Vienna, where she would meet a Swiss artist named Thomas Lips, who she had a brief relationship with. Mixed with the profoundly horrific effect of the Hermann Nitsch performance and the brief fling with Thomas Lips, Abramovich then became inspired to conceptualize her next performance in Vienna, which she would subsequently give the title Thomas Lips, or The Lips of Thomas. This performance, again, would have limited information surrounding it compared to her other work, with only a few photographs and video clips of the piece still existing today. The most well-known photograph being that of a five-pointed star that Marina would carve onto her stomach. Marina would detail the performance in her biography as follows. 
I slowly eat one kilo of honey with a silver spoon. I slowly drink one liter of red wine out of a crystal glass. I break the glass with my right hand. I cut a five-pointed star on my stomach with a razor blade. I violently whip myself until I no longer feel any pain. I lie down on a cross made of ice blocks. The heat of a suspended heater pointed at my stomach causes the cut star to bleed and the rest of my body behind to freeze. I remain on the ice cross for 30 minutes until the public interrupts the peace by removing the ice blocks from underneath me. Duration, two hours. End quote. Although the spectators, according to Abramovich, were familiar with provocative art and performances, this particular piece proved to even be too much for them. After some spectators rushed to the stage to cover Marina in coats and help her off the ice, she then had to be taken to hospital, not for her wounds from the whip or the self-inflicted star she cut onto her stomach, but for her right hand that she had unintentionally gouged when she broke the wine glass that would need a great deal of stitches. Towards the end of 1975, on Marina's 29th birthday, she received an invitation to take part in a new upcoming performance, this time in a gallery in Amsterdam known as De Apple, for the Dutch TV show called Beeldspruck. In early December, Abramovich arrived in Amsterdam to meet the curator at the airport, who was accompanied by another individual, a German artist who went by the name of Ulai, who was to be Marina's guide and assistant for her performances. At that moment, Marina seemed to be instantly enthralled by him. Quote, Ulai, his real name I found out was Frank Uwe Leisipen, but he never used it, was in his early 30s, tall and skinny, with long flowing hair that he tied up in the back with a pair of chopsticks. A fact that was immediately interesting to me, because I did my hair the exact same way. But the other interesting thing was that the two halves of his face were different. The left side was shaved smooth and powdered, with a plucked eyebrow and light rouge on his lips. The right side was stubbly and a little greasy, with a normal eyebrow and no makeup. If you saw either side in profile, you would get a completely different impression, masculine on one side, feminine on the other." End quote. As she spent time with him in Amsterdam, they would discover quite surprising similarities to each other, the biggest coincidence being that they shared the same birthday of November 30th. As time went on, they spent more time with each other and began to form an incredibly passionate romantic relationship. But this ultimately would only be the beginning of a partnership that would change both of their lives quite significantly. Falling deeply in love with Ulai, a man who she truly felt was destined for her, made leaving Amsterdam to once again return to Belgrade all the more difficult. Not to mention that she was still married to Nesha Palopovich and living with her mother. It was a relationship riddled with forbidden desire and one that would have to be kept secret for a long time. On top of this, she was also forced to resign from her teaching job due to the emerging pictures of her rhythm performances that would cause a scandal. At this stage, Abramovich was left with little choice but to plan her escape from Belgrade for good and to live with Ulai. She packed light, only taking a handful of belongings, with the majority of her things only being a portfolio of her work, and she secretly left on a train to Amsterdam, not once looking back. By 1976, not long after Marina's final departure from Belgrade, she and Nesha eventually divorced. Not long after moving in together, Marina and Ulai, realizing more and more how their perceptions of art were merged into one with their similar personalities, traits, and artistic backgrounds, they began planning performance art projects together. Inspiration for their first ever collaborative performance came from an unlikely item in their possession, a Newton's Cradle. 
Ulai for one was absolutely fascinated in the motion of it, and the illusion of the ball bearings essentially transferring energy and movement to each other. Therefore, the idea came to them both to do the same, to collide into each other, and to merge their energy into one. Although the movements would not be as clean or precise as a Newton's cradle, Ulai and Marina both recognised the beauty in that, a rawness that could be encapsulated by the project, and thus, the performance known as Relation in Space was conceptualised. Quote, The idea of this piece was two naked bodies running and hitting each other frontally and increasing the speed for one hour. We really wanted to have this male and female energy put together and create something we called that self. It was very important to collaborate and to mix our ideas together and not ever say to anybody from whom the idea comes from. It was the mixture that really made sense to us and created that kind of third energy field." End quote. The performance took place for the annual Venice Biennale art event in a warehouse on the island of Guadeca in Venice, Italy, in front of a few hundred spectators. Microphones were apparently meticulously positioned in order to capture the sound of their increasingly intense collisions, which at some stages would send Marina collapsing to the floor. The idea as a whole was to perform something that was as minimalist as possible, and according to Abramovich, nothing could be more minimal than two naked bodies in any empty space, and with the only sound being emitted would be two bodies slamming into each other. As for the reaction of the audience, as well as their interpretation, it was clear that they could sense Marina and Ulai were in love, but this added more mystery to their somewhat aggressive performance. Just who were they exactly? Why were they colliding? And was there some kind of hostility in their relationship being released in this bizarre display? These sorts of questions being projected from the audience, much like many of Marina's projects up till now, was the final ingredient to complete the artwork. Following Relation in Space, Marina and Ulai would make an ambitious decision. They decided they would leave the city of Amsterdam behind and give up most, if not all, of their possessions to completely focus on their performance art together. They purchased a corrugated iron van, which Ulai painted black, and they would spend three years living and travelling in it, devoting themselves completely to a nomadic lifestyle free from all attachments and utterly dedicated to travelling to multiple places to perform their projects. Marina would look back on this particular time of her career as being one of the happiest periods of her life. During 1977, Ulai and Marina materialised many interesting concepts, all of which would have virtually no rehearsals nor any particular end goal. All that was planned would be the idea itself and the place and time to perform it. One of which would be the piece titled Relation and Movement. This involved the pair driving their van inside of a museum for 365 laps. A black liquid oozed from the car, forming a perfect circle. The idea was that each lap represented a year and after 365 laps, they, quote, entered the new millennium. Another piece, titled Relation in Time, they set back to back, tied together by their ponytails for a total of 16 hours. As time went on, their hair would eventually come apart, strand by strand. They allowed the public to enter the room to see if they could use the energy of the public to push their limits even further. Another well-known piece, titled Breathing In, Breathing Out, was a particularly surreal, yet very simple performance that garnered wide attention. In this, the duo locked their mouths together and basically inhaled each other's exhalations until they had used up all the available oxygen. Quote, We stuck cigarette filters in our nostrils to block the air, and we taped little microphones to our throats. We kneeled down facing each other, 
I blew all the air out of my lungs, and Ulai breathed in all the air he could. Then we clamped our mouths together, and he blew his air into my mouth. Then I blew the air back to him. As our mouths stayed fixed together, as the sound of our breathing, and then our gasping, was amplified, we exchanged again and again that one lungful of air, which became less and less oxygen and more and more carbon dioxide as it was exhaled time after time. After 19 minutes, there was no oxygen left. We stopped just before losing consciousness. End quote. It would also be during 1977 that one of Marina Abramovich's trademark performances would first be conceptualized, the piece titled Imponderabilia, where Ulai and Marina, both completely nude, would stand in a narrow doorway. And in order for the public to pass to another section of the exhibition, they must squeeze sideways between them, and in doing so, choose which one of them to face. Many other performance artists, as the years went by, would recreate this concept in Marina Abramovich retrospectives. I've actually personally witnessed this myself, and what I always find so interesting is seeing which one of the two performers a member of the public chooses to face towards when passing through. The pattern that I personally began to notice quite often is normally a woman chose to face the naked female performer, and a man chose to face the male performer. As to why this is, I'm not quite sure. Perhaps society has conditioned people when in these types of situations to have more trust in their own gender, or that they feel that to face the naked member of the opposite sex could be disrespectful or perverse in some way. Either way, I thought it was fascinating to witness. Light, Dark was a performance that again was creatively simple, yet surreal in execution. Ulai and Marina would kneel opposite each other and begin the performance by slowly slapping each other in the face. Much like relation in space, it began slowly but increased in pace as time went on. Ulai turns his cheek towards Abramovich when she swipes at him, whereas Abramovich turns her face away. The performance ends when Abramovich ducks her head, evading the next slap. According to Ulai, Light, dark, was supposed to express the relationship between man and woman. As he explains, quote, We express the various aspects between men and women. The work wasn't only about ourselves. Our relationship made the work possible, but the performances were not a direct image of our private relationship. End quote. Marina too would comment on the piece, saying, quote, It is not the pain itself that matters. We never did things for the pleasure of pain. We were looking for a key, a way to break through the body, to open something up, which is a desire that comes from another side of truth or reality." End quote. In the following year of 1978, Ulai and Marina conceptualized the bizarre performance known as, um, Ah, uh, Ah? Uh, I guess. <laughs> Let's just go with that. Here they stood opposite each other and made long sounds with their mouths open. Gradually they would move closer and closer to one another until eventually they would yell directly into each other's open mouths. The performance would last 15 minutes. By the time both artists' voices would end up out of sync and failing from a continuous yelling. The purpose of his piece was to demonstrate their interest in endurance and duration, as well as exploring aggression between physically present figures, one male and one female, not too dissimilar from the concept of the light dark performance. But one project of performance art by Marina and Ulai, from a certain point of view, would be a callback to a much earlier performance of Marina's. 
Her infamous Rhythm Zero performance back in Italy was without a doubt an experiment of surrendering complete and utter trust to the audience in order to complete the artwork. But when it came to the 1980 performance of Rest Energy, this time she would offer her trust and vulnerability entirely to her lover, Ulai. Although only lasting four minutes, Marina would look back on this performance as one of the hardest pieces she's ever had to do. Quote, I was not in charge in rest energy. We actually held an arrow on the weight of our bodies and the arrow was pointed right into my heart. We had two small microphones near our hearts so we could hear our heartbeats. As our performance was progressing, heartbeats were becoming more and more intense. And though it lasted just four minutes and 10 seconds, I'm telling you, for me, it was forever. It was a performance about complete and total trust. End quote. Whether audiences loathed or admired them, Marina and Ulai seem to have been successful in their goal to bring something new and unexpected to the art world. Their ambition to let go of their individual egos to instead merge together to manifest one creative personality was accomplished, and sitting on the summit of a performance art scene. But as the years went by, a pattern was beginning to form. For whatever reason, in spite of their admirable ability to work seamlessly as a duo, the attention of the audience was gradually beginning to shift focus more towards Marina than Ulai. When the media, press, and art magazines would talk about their performances, most would mention Abramovich first, and in some cases, they would leave out Ulai altogether, talking only of Marina or mistaking Ulai to be her assistant rather than her counterpart in the performances. Regardless, the couple continued to perform together throughout the 1980s. The most well-known work during this period would be a series of 22 performances that took place between 1981 and 1987 in 19 locations across a number of continents titled Night Sea Crossing. During the performances, Ulai and Abramovich sat completely still and in silence at either end of a table facing each other. In relation to this project would be the work displayed beside it, known as Conjunction, which was deeply inspired by Marina's growing interest in spirituality, particularly Tibetan Buddhism, and the time she and Ulai spent in Australia, coming face to face with Aboriginal culture, which according to Abramovich, was an experience that proved to be one of her most transformative. Quote, We chose this culture for many reasons. First, it's nomadic. The second, this culture doesn't have possessions. It's a culture where we always believe in the idea of here and now, which is exactly what performance is about. And the third thing is that their entire life is the ceremony. And this piece, Conjunction, was really historically important because it was the first time ever that an Aborigine and a Tibetan Lama physically ever met. We decided to construct a very large table covered with 24 karat gold leaves. And at that table, Ulai and I are sitting in the western position. And opposite the table is a Tibetan Lama and a high degree medicine man sitting in a cross leg position. We are there sitting four days and seven hours a day, just sitting in a meditative state." End quote. Things did not seem to improve in the relationship between Marina and Ulai, however. Although still deeply caring for each other, they were distancing further from each other. Their passion was beginning to wear thin, and tensions only seemed to rise. The effect their success was having on each of them was also drastically different. Ulai never really cared that much for the lifestyle of fame or for being in such a spotlight. Being a lifelong anarchist who enjoyed solitude, he began rebelling against what he saw as a growing commercialization of their work. Marina, however, was growing weary of a poor struggling artist's life and welcomed growing success. Sure enough, by 1988, they would make a spiritual journey that would ultimately mark the end of their passionate and intense relationship, an art stunt which at the time had never even been seen before. 
named Lovers, The Great Wall Walk. What would make this project so bittersweet would not just be the fact that it marked the end of their partnership and relationship, but the fact that it was originally planned for many years prior, in 1983, when they proposed to be the first people to walk the entire distance of the Great Wall of China, the famous ancient monument originally built as a defense against invaders from the north and west of the country. Setting off alone from opposite ends, they planned to meet right in the middle, where they intended to marry each other. The concept exhilarated them both, the idea was so grand, and even in their early stages of planning the stunt, Marina especially knew that it would be nothing short of historic. The couple visualized themselves walking alone across the dramatic landscapes of China, camping under the stars and romantically concluding their journey through wedlock. They envisioned lovers as not just a great journey to celebrate their love and commitment for each other, but also an art display in which they would be both the performers and the audience. However, it would be no simple feat to accomplish. Initially, the authorities of Beijing reportedly struggled to grasp Ulai and Marina's motifs for their excursion. Performance art, especially of their style and caliber, was practically unheard of in China, to them, it seemed rather preposterous to camp and walk along the great historical monument for a quote-unquote art project, not to mention get married on it. Regardless, after many years of pushback, they were finally granted permission when they both agreed to participate in a film of their quote, study of the Great Wall for Chinese Central Television. But by then, their relationship had completely dissolved. In spite of this, however, they decided to pursue their plans and go ahead with the stunt, changing the narrative from one of marriage to one of separation. The long walk began for them on March 30th, 1988. Abramovich set off westwards from the Dragon's Head at the Bodai Sea, an extension of the Yellow Sea between China and the Korean Peninsula. Dressed in baggy red clothes, she was, according to an informative article by The Guardian on the lover's stunt, given the nickname Parma Tajé, meaning Big Fat Sister Mother. As for Ulai, he began his journey 5,000 kilometers west of Abramovich, starting his walk at the Dragon's Tail in the Gobi Desert. The walk proved to be incredibly grueling, with both artists covering a distance of approximately 2,500 kilometers over a period of 90 days. Abramovich, walking most of her journey through mountainous regions of China, came across many difficult and inaccessible paths. At one point on her fourth day, after slipping on some rocks, Abramovich and her guide found themselves nearly falling to their deaths. Of course, both artists would also see amazing sights along the way, such as locals who had built homes and stables into sections of a winding wall, who would also assist them on their travels and share stories and legends about the land. Many of these crowds from the surrounding towns and villages, fascinated in the artists, silently followed them wherever they went. In one settlement, villagers even gathered around and watched Abramovich as she slept. Finally, on a stone bridge, Ulai and Abramovich met at the center. Marina would quote on the experience as follows. That walk became a complete personal drama. Ulai started from the Gobi Desert, and I from the Yellow Sea. After each of us walked 2,500 kilometers, we met in the middle and said goodbye. We needed a certain form of ending after walking this huge distance towards each other. It is very human. It is, in a way, more dramatic. More like a film ending. Because in the end, you really are alone, whatever you do." End quote. Despite the Chinese press, a group of musicians, and even a fireworks display being prepared for the couple upon the climax of their journey, there would be no wedding ceremony. They simply took part in a press conference together in Beijing, then they returned separately to Amsterdam and would not speak nor see each other again for 22 years. On 
Although one big chapter of her life had now ended with Ulai, another very significant interest was now fueling Marina, which was finding her sense of deep and personal spirituality, particularly within nature and the unknown. During her hike on the Great Wall, she spoke of how she felt that the metals in the ground influenced her mood and her state of being. She also pondered on the Chinese myths that she was told by the locals, in which the Great Wall had been described as, quote, a dragon of energy. But even before Lovers, during the 1980s, Abramovich had deeply immersed herself in Tibetan Buddhism, studying and meditating at monasteries, which would later profoundly impact her understanding of the mind-body connection and the potential for transcendence through artistic expression. But rather than following one spiritual path such as Buddhism exclusively, Marina's spirituality is not confined to any particular religious dogma. Rather, it is a synthesis of various influences that she has encountered throughout her life. Her performances often serve as a form of spiritual exploration, pushing the boundaries of the self and inviting the audience to engage with their own spiritual dimensions such as allowing the audience to step into shoes made of crystals for a 1991 art piece titled Shoes for Departure, in order to encourage a certain state of mind from the participants. Quote, I have instructions for the public to take off your shoes and, with naked feet, put on the two crystal shoes. Close your eyes, don't move, and make your departure. I'm talking about a mental, not physical departure. So the public can enter certain states of mind, helped by the material itself. Material is very important for me. I use crystals, human hair, copper, iron. The materials already have a certain energy. End quote. Her fascination in meditation taught in Tibetan Buddhism, as well as the profound spiritual connection she developed for the natural world, would only continue to reach new heights throughout the 1990s and kickstart many new concepts. In fact, by 1995, when she was organizing her piece titled Cleaning the Mirror, this would be directly inspired by Tibetan death rites that prepared disciples to become one with their own mortality. Cleaning the Mirror is a series of related performances and video installations that explore themes of mortality, impermanence, and the purification of the soul. Abramovich sits on a chair with a complete human skeleton on her lap. A bucket of soapy water stands beside her. For several hours, she meticulously scrubs the bones with a floor brush, cleaning away the dirt and grime that has accumulated on the bones over time. The performance is both physically and emotionally demanding. Abramovich's face is often stained with concentration, and her movements are slow and deliberate. The sound of a brush scraping against the bones is amplified, creating a sense of raw intimacy. As Abramovich cleans the skeleton, it gradually becomes whiter and more luminous. This could be seen as a metaphor for the cleansing of a soul, or the process of facing one's own mortality. The dirt that is removed from the bones could represent the negative aspects of the self, such as fear, anger, ignorance, pride, and attachment. What makes it more interesting is that in cleaning the skeleton, Marina then becomes the one covered in dirt, symbolizing the transference of these negative qualities, almost like a sacrifice for the benefit of the skeleton. But in truth, cleaning the mirror can be interpreted in many different ways. Some viewers see it as a meditation on death, while others see it as a call to live each moment to the fullest. For Abramovich though, the skeleton represents, quote, the last mirror we will all face in a work dominated by death and transience. This would not be the only time skeletons would appear in her performances though. For example, later on in her career, she would conceptualize her type of self-portrait performance, titled Nude with Skeleton, which evokes a traditional exercise undertaken by Tibetan monks during which they slept and meditated alongside the dead in various states of decay. Through this practice, they gain an understanding of a process of death and impermanence. 
Quote, In different periods of my life, I made several works using a skeleton. I construct the skeleton of my own size, and I lie posing the skeleton on my body. By breathing slowly, the skeleton gets animated and moves together with me. The work is really about facing your own mortality. It's about fear of pain and fear of dying. It's something that, in our life, we all fear the most. And again, in my own work, I always like to confront these fears. So being close to the skeleton, washing it, carrying it, breathing through it, looking at it and confronting it, is the way to deal with that fear. End quote. In keeping within the concept of bones and the act of cleaning them, another one of Marina's most famous works of the 90s would be her piece titled Balkan Baroque, first conducted in 1997 in Venice, Italy. But before we can truly attempt to comprehend the concept of this particular piece, we need to look at what exactly inspired it, or rather, what exactly it memorializes. Between 1992 and 1995, a brutal and tragic conflict unfolded in former Yugoslavia, specifically in the multi-ethnic Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was a complex war fueled by ethnic tensions and the breakup of Marina's former country of Yugoslavia, with devastating consequences for the country and its people. Following a referendum on Bosnian independence, Bosnian Serbs declared their own state and an armed conflict erupted. Serb forces, backed by the Yugoslav People's Army, laid siege to major cities like Sarajevo and launched offences to capture territory. The war was marked by horrific acts of ethnic cleansing, where Serb forces systematically expelled or killed Bosniaks and Croats from areas they claimed. The Srebrenica massacre in 1995, where thousands of Bosniak men and boys were murdered, became a chilling symbol of the war's barbarity. The international community initially struggled to respond effectively to the conflict. However, as the atrocities mounted, NATO airstrikes against Serb positions in 1995 helped turn the tide of the war. That same year, the Dayton Accords were signed, bringing an official end to the war. The agreement established a complex power-sharing system for Bosnia and Herzegovina, divided into two entities, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, dominated by the Bosniaks and the Croats, and the Republic of Srpska. Although the war ended, the Bosnian War left deep scars on the land and its people. Over 100,000 lives were lost, and millions were displaced. The war also exposed the dangers of ethnic nationalism and the importance of international cooperation in preventing such conflicts. It's important to remember the Bosnian War not only for its tragic events, but also as a stark reminder of the fragility of peace and the need for tolerance and understanding in the diverse world that we live in. Naturally, Marina Abramovich would be one of the many figureheads who would be deeply affected by the conflict. Quote, when the war started in Bosnia, it was such a difficult time for me. I was not there. I had been living for such a long time outside the country, and I remember so many artists immediately reacting and making work and protests on the horrors of that war. And I remember that I could not do anything. It was too close to me. I went to Belgrade and I interviewed my mother, my father, and a man who caught rats for 35 years of his life. There are a few things happening in this installation. It's positioned so the hands of my father, my father with a pistol, my mother's fist showing empty hands and then with crossed hands on her eyes. And then it's me, first as a doctor, telling the story of a rat catcher, and then as a sexy dancer, dancing to the Hungarian Chadash. And in the meantime, there's a huge pile of bones, which during the entire performance, I'm sitting and washing. It was summer in Venice, very, very hot, and after a few days, already worms started coming out of the bones, 
and the smell was unbearable. The whole idea that by washing bones and trying to scrub the blood is impossible. You can't wash the blood from your hands as you can't wash the shame from the war. But also it was important to transcend it. That can be used, this image, for any war, anywhere in the world. End quote. This, personally for me, is my favourite performance of Marina's. I remember seeing a retrospective of this at the Royal Academy in London and just being completely overwhelmed with emotions. I remember staring at the pile of bones for a vast length of time whilst listening to Marina's voice in the background. And let me tell you, it hits you deep like nothing you can imagine. And I felt it was true what she said. Although directly manifested from the horrors of the Bosnian War, in truth, this piece encapsulates the horrors, brutality, and insanity of practically any war, making it such a universally powerful artwork. Ultimately, many people were proven to have felt the same way. This installation earned Abramovich the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Biennale that year. At the turn of the new millennium, Marina Abramovich at this stage appeared to be revisiting a grassroots concept of hers that arguably served as one of the main factors that shoved her career into the global spotlight from the very beginning, which was an intimate and close interaction between herself and the audience. Throughout the 2000s, Marina would conceptualize installations that would deepen the connection between herself and the spectators. In the wake of the tragedy of 9-11 in 2001, she began working on her piece titled The House with an Ocean View in the following year. That, according to her, served as a means to immerse both herself and the audience in a sort of purifying energy. As explained by her, quote, House with an Ocean View was for me an experiment. When I came to New York, it was just after September 11th, and I found New York had changed so much. I found New York and people living there different, more emotional, more vulnerable, more spiritual. The idea of the work was an experiment. If I purify myself without eating for 12 days, any kind of food, just drinking pure water, and being in the present moment, here and now, in the three units of the wall which represents my house, like the bathroom, the living room, and the sleeping room, where the ladder coming down to the space is made of knives, so you can never leave. That kind of rigorous way of living and purification would do something to change the environment and to change the attitude of people coming to see me. If they will just come and stay and forget about the time, I had in this period people who came just for a few minutes and then stayed for three hours, four hours, and came the next day to stay even longer, without really understanding what's happening. But there's something like, I almost think that if you are in the present moment, you are purified and that you can create a kind of energy field that you can charge on an atomic level of the space in a certain way with the public and feel and just be in the present time." End quote. However, one groundbreaking durational piece that seemed to capture the most intimacy between herself and the audience, as well as receive the most worldwide attention in recent years, was between March 14th to May 31st in 2010 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. For three months, she sat motionless in a chair, inviting visitors to take the opposite seat and silently engage with her gaze. Titled The Artist is Present, the performance became a landmark event in contemporary art, sparking profound emotional connections and raising questions about human presence, vulnerability, and connection. Quote, I have the empty chair, so everybody from the audience can come on their free time and sit in front of me and engage in this kind of silence, experience of the here and now, the present moment. 
so you can observe this as kind of a stage for the experience, or you can really enter that space and take active participation, which actually brings you much closer to the artist, and this presence, and to your own experience. If you sit on this chair opposite me, it's extremely important to actually find a very comfortable position, and you don't move. Just sit motionless, and see what happens if we connect our eyes. And I really think that it's going to be something quite special to go into this unknown territory. Because of the energy coming from the audience, I have to be the transmitter and receiver at the same time. That energy just goes through me. And to be ready for the next visitor, and the next one, and the next one. End quote. Of course, each encounter was unique from person to person. Some simply stared, some smiled, some would burst into tears, and one woman, as seen in the Artist's Present documentary, would even attempt to strip naked before sitting opposite her, but would subsequently be escorted out by security. For those who did sit opposite her though, what's fascinating to see is that Abramovich would completely mirror the expressions and emotions of her sitters. For example, if someone would cry, she too would start crying, sharing that exact same emotion together in an incredible moment of oneness. Understandably though, due to the nature of the piece that sitters could choose the duration of time spent with Marina, with some sitting for just a few minutes and others up to an entire day, this made tensions within the sometimes endless queue of people difficult to control at times. Almost being a callback to the raw public energy captured within her Rhythm Zero performance. By the end of it, Abramovich sat across 1,545 sitters in total, including an impressive list of celebrities such as James Franco, Lou Reed, Alan Rickman, Jemima Kirk, Jennifer Carpenter, Orlando Bloom, and Bjork. However, one of the earliest sitters during the retrospective that would garner viral attention would be none other than Ulai himself. After many years of not seeing each other ever since the Great Wall of China, Ulai arrived unannounced at the museum. He would sit down opposite Marina, as she looked up and opened her eyes to see who was sitting opposite her, the moment captured between them both is quite simply so powerful. The overwhelming joy they both have for seeing each other again is quite clear to see, and he can't help but feel moved by this moment. It's worth remembering this is a woman who went through Rhythm Zero, despite being cut, threatened, abused, and nearly shot with a loaded gun. But to see Ulai again was the moment that broke her. Putting that into perspective really does show the care that they still had for each other back then. It's just a shame that Ulai and Marina then got into a messy royalties dispute no more than five years later. Like, talk about a bittersweet relationship. But in any case, the artist's presence remains a pivotal moment in contemporary art history. It continues to be celebrated for its raw emotional power, its exploration of human connection, and its challenge to the conventions of artistic practice, and one that Marina claimed changed her life entirely by the end of it. So I want to end this documentary by talking about something that I know is going to get a lot of mixed opinions. Although at this point, it's fair to say that Marina Abramovich was not one to shy away from controversy or incredibly bold ideas for her performances, and in spite of the boundaries she had already pushed even earlier on in her career, nothing would be quite as divisive and incredibly outlandish as her provocative performance that I've not yet mentioned, known as Spirit Cooking conceived in 1996. Always gotta save the best till last, eh? This particular project began with an idea for a book, a cookbook to be precise, that would be a collaborative effort between her and printer publisher Jacob Samuel in her Amsterdam studio. As explained on the Museum of Modern Art website, quote, the artist chose to make a cookbook, writing a series of aphrodisiac recipes that serve as evocative instructions for actions or thoughts. 
to allow the artist to create the accompanying etches in a manner consistent with her body-oriented practice, Samuel prepared the plates with a soft ground so she could scratch directly on the surface with her fingernails, and encouraged her to work with spit bite, using her own saliva with nitric acid to paint on the plate." End quote. These quote-unquote aphrodisiac recipes were essentially playfully provocative poems by Abramovich, inspired by the popular folk belief that ghosts feed off intangible things like light, sound, and emotions. Jacob Samuel would comment on the concept as follows. In 1994, I designed a portable studio that I could put in a crate and ship all over the world so I could work with artists in their own studios. I wanted to be able to work with artists in their own environments and see where that would lead. Marina was very open to whatever I suggested in terms of technique, but right away, I could see that she had a very specific working process. Because she's a performance artist, and because she uses her body for everything, she was a little uncomfortable drawing with a pencil or an etching needle. So I suggested that we use soft ground and that she draw with her fingernails, and occasionally she would use her fingerprints. She used spit bite aquatint, which she liked to use because it actually mixes the artist's saliva with nitric acid. So again, it's related to her body. This is exactly what I hoped would happen by creating a portable studio that the artist would be so in tune with their own environment, that translating it into another physical context would be irrelevant." End quote. So, if it's just supposed to be a fantasy cookbook consisting of make-believe recipes, what exactly provoked so much controversy compared to her other work? Well, if we take a look at a few examples, you'll quickly notice that some of these are extremely bizarre and at times straight-up grotesque ranging from eating nine red hot peppers whilst facing a wall to, and I'm not even kidding here, mixing fresh breast milk with fresh sperm milk. So to someone completely unfamiliar with Marina's outlandish creative personality, it's clear to see how this would be quite shocking to the unsuspecting eye. But the project would not just end there. In the following year of 1997, Abramovich conducted a multimedia spirit cooking installation at a gallery in Rome, Italy, where she would write strange instructions and recipes in pig's blood all over the white walls of a showroom. Phrases included things like, spin around until you lose consciousness, try to eat all the questions of the day, or saliva of your lover mixed with morning dew collected from eucalyptus leaves would just be a few examples. Now again, given what we know of her work in the past, this is pretty shocking and gruesome, but relatively nothing out of the ordinary when it comes to Abramovich in the grand scheme of things. With a great deal of context removed, I can certainly see how this would look barbaric and, I guess I'll use that word now, satanic. But the fact is, if you really want to find out why this received so much backlash, I'm afraid that will involve going down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole, and I hate to break it to you, but this is an art channel, not a conspiracy theory channel. There's also a lot of American politics involved with the conspiracy as well, and, well, have you heard my accent? American politics is not exactly my strong suit either, so that's really as far as I will go for this one, I'm afraid. Obviously, people are completely entitled to think what they will when it comes to this particular work of hers. Like I said, I can completely understand why this would provoke such a reaction. I'm sure if she decided to put on more nice sounding recipes, like mix gumdrops with daisies and feed off for happiness, and it was all written in sugar icing, I'm pretty sure no one would even bat an eyelid. But if you're watching this video expecting to hear what I personally think, I honestly have no other opinion other than, well yeah, it's Marina Abramovich. It doesn't exactly surprise me that she would work on something like this. Do I share her beliefs or her perspectives? No. Whether or not she's a Satanist or a witch, whatever word you want to use, quite frankly that's none of my business. My focus on this channel is on the artwork itself. 
and whatever proven, reliable facts are available for me to research from. If you like conspiracies, that's totally fine, but I personally don't consider these things to be reliable sources of information. I'm sorry. If one day it comes out that Marina is confirmed beyond reasonable doubt that she is more, shall we say, morally questionable than we initially thought, then I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But for now, all I see Marina Abramovich as is an extremely blunt, raw, outrageous, provocative, and controversial performance artist that not everybody is going to love. Love. But here's the thing, if we lived in a world where every solitary thing was objectively something to like or hate, just what kind of existence would that be? The world has never been neat little boxes and categories, and to think otherwise is simply unrealistic. And that's the true beauty of art, it's one of the few things we've created as a species that points out these kind of complexities of life, because art is limitless and doesn't have to have rules. I would absolutely be lying if I said I like every project Abramovich has conducted though. I'll be honest, I'm not even sure I fully get her or agree with her most of the time. Sometimes I think she does go too far, sometimes I do feel like some of her performances are just exploitative or self-deprecation on display. Sometimes I think the way she treats people is completely selfish and insensitive based on what I've read in her book. Sometimes I think her art isn't my idea of art at all. But let me ask you something. Whether you love her or absolutely despise her, can you honestly say, regardless of how you feel about her, that she hasn't had some kind of impact on you? In my eyes, if that's not the result of a successful artist, then I don't know what is. I think performance art is one of those anomalies within creativity that's always going to get very split reactions. Don't get me wrong, I've seen some terrible performance art, and I too pick and choose what constitutes real art based on my own experiences and personal tastes. But that's exactly my point. There should never be a definitive answer within art. It's just like music. Just because you don't like a certain genre of music, that doesn't necessarily mean the genre is definitively bad. Or if I don't like a certain type of food, again, just because I have different preferences, that doesn't mean that the chef who cooked it is all of a sudden bad at cooking. I know it seems like an obvious thing to say, but I can't help but feel when it comes to this certain genre of contemporary art, that people tend to forget this side of things. And Marina Abramovich is an artist who I don't think I'll ever truly be able to fully wrap my head around. I find her fascinating, but even going to her retrospective at the Royal Academy left me feeling both inspired and on the other hand feeling like, okay, what the fuck did I just witness? But having said that, I can't think of another experience in art quite like it, so I absolutely consider that noteworthy. In conclusion then, despite the criticisms and controversies, the legacy of Marina Abramovich remains undeniable. She's challenged our understanding of art, pushed the boundaries of human performance, and fostered profound moments of connection between artist and audience, many times almost effortlessly. Her work continues to inspire awe and introspection, drawing in huge crowds of people worldwide, sparking huge debates of course, all ensuring her place as one of the most influential artists presently alive today, whether for better or for worse. She's been relatively quiet with new ideas in recent years, mostly leaving it to the hardworking new generation of performance artists from her Marina Abramovich Institute. But it will be interesting to see how both her most loyal fans and her most passionate haters will react to whatever she has next in store. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found this documentary interesting. Before I go, I'd like to take a moment to share my end of video segment called Artist Corner. Here I get to show and discuss some artwork sent to me by one of my lovely viewers. And today's featured artist is an experimental photographer who goes by the name of Rocco from Algeria in Africa. Rocco has been doing photography for six years and the journey into this medium started when he asked himself one simple question. What is originality? This question came to fruition when he noticed how he felt a lot of artists in his country seemed to be lacking something fresh and new. He tells me he's always seen the same thing over and over, and he felt a strong need to do something different. With that, he picked up a camera and began capturing the world around him in a very dark and boldly surreal way. 
However, what makes his photography so unique is that he never aims to capture what he sees with his camera, but instead captures what he feels inwardly. As he explains, quote, I just capture a feeling. It's not about the subject. It's about how I feel most of the time. I take maybe hundreds of photos, but I find myself more interested in the process and the finished project. End quote. He tells me his main inspiration is the people that he sees on the streets and in his neighborhood, which he describes as, quote, an empty zoo. Often he is met with hostility when he approaches people or places for photos in his country. Despite asking for consent and showing them his portfolio, very often he will be accused of using the photos for witchcraft. Perhaps this is why a lot of expressions of the people he photographs show a sense of malice in his work. Because according to Rocco, in their eyes, he's doing something forbidden, something that he could even go to jail for. I find his style of photography extremely gripping. He certainly has a talent of capturing moments of dread and uncertainty, as well as a foreboding atmosphere. But what I find particularly clever is how he edits a lot of his photographs to look almost like hand-drawn sketches, which really stands out as an aesthetically eye-catching trademark in his work. I think his photography is certainly a mysterious and fascinating journey to immerse yourself in. So if you want to see more, and of course show him some support, please head over to his Instagram page via the link you see here now, or in the video description below. By the way, if you're an artist, photographer, sculptor, performer, or anything of the like, and fancy being featured on my channel, it would be great to meet you. Please send me an email with examples of your work and a little paragraph about yourself to blinddweller at gmail.com or feel free to give me a message on Instagram. Finally, as always, a huge thank you to all of my patrons and channel members. Here's a special shout out to all of my top tier donators. Port Perea, Miles Z, Grape, Vladsev, Tyler Butler, Harley Raven, Eric Lamarca, Dave MC, Molotail, The New on Gorm 24, Equatomok, Ken B, Lee Flowers, Calvin Kai, Akaiza, Carol H, Large Fatty or Big Chad, and Charlie Sanchezy. That's all for me today. See you in the next video soon. Keep being creative, and bye for now.